crazy here the last couple of days. That's fine. Um, I just hit the send button on the report that I was trying to get done. So okay, okay. That, we no, can talk fine. more later if, if need be. Okay. Hey Kyle, it's six and we are live. If you guys wanna go ahead and get started, we have 31 attendees out of the registered 60. So they might be popping in soon. All right, we'll go ahead and get started uh, since we're on a little, little bit of a limited time schedule tonight. Um, so first and foremost, I just wanted to thank everybody in attendance tonight for their interest in this uh, project. We're here tonight for the design public hearing for the Barracks Road and Emmett Street intersection project being administered by the city. Uh, my name is Kyle Kling. I'm with the Department of Public Works and the project manager for this project. Um, I'll start things off by just giving a brief overview of what to expect tonight. Uh, we'll get things started with a brief uh, pre-recorded presentation that'll last about 15 minutes or so. Uh, that presentation will just highlight the basic design characteristics of this project and walk everybody through some of the public outreach um, phases that we've been through to date on the project. Uh, following that presentation, uh, we'll, open up, uh, um, we'll open up the floor for question and answers uh, sessions to attendees. Uh, that session is just to have an informal back and forth with the design team and get a little more clarity on some of the aspects that may not be conveyed um, during the presentation. Uh, following that, question and answer session. We'll begin the formal public comment period for this project. Uh, I'll go into more detail on that when we get to that uh, stage. But uh, for those of you who are familiar with Planning Commission uh, public hearings or City Council public hearings, uh, it's very similar to, um, to that. Um, prior to getting started, I'd just like to um, do a brief round of introductions uh, with various panelists. So at this time, I'll hand it over to our design consultant for the project, uh, Brian Copeland with the Timmins Group. Good evening, thank you, Kyle. Uh, again, my name is Brian Copeland. Um, I'm with Timmins Group, been with Timmins for nearly 20 years. I've uh, had the pleasure of working with Kyle since the beginning on this project. And those of you who have attended previous 
public workshops and other public events uh, know me and our team. Um, but again, it's been a pleasure to work with the community to try to develop the plan you're going to see tonight. So I'm looking, I feel I'm excited to share it with you. And I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Tim introduce himself. Um, yeah, my name is Tim Mach. Uh, I've been uh, working on transportation uh, project management with Kyle for nearly four years now. Uh, and I will be taking over the project. Uh, Kyle is uh, re relocating back to Northern Virginia in the not too distant future. Uh, I have been familiar with the project uh, and I have worked with Brian a little bit on the West Main project. So uh, I am uh, uh, familiar with it. I've been working on the Emmett Streetscape project as well as the East High Streetscape project. So I'm also familiar with the processes and where we are in the project. Thank you. Um, Michael, did you want to introduce yourself followed by Brennan? Sure, thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Michael Barnes. I work with BDOT. Uh, this project is a part of a BDOT city partnership with BDOT providing a significant portion of the funding for the project. Um, I'm here tonight to serve if any questions come up in that regard. Uh, I think it's been a good project so far and I look forward to getting on to the next step. Thank you. Thank you, Brennan. And I'm Brennan Duncan. I'm the city traffic engineer. Um, I've been involved in this project since the original, original application um, to VDOT that came about as part of the um, site plan development for both the parcels on the corner of Emmett Street and, uh, and Barracks Road. Great, thanks everyone. So I'll go ahead and get this uh, presentation queued up uh, real quick here and we'll get uh, things underway. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yes. Welcome to the Barracks Road and Emmett Street Improvements Project Design Public Hearing. This presentation is being brought to you by the City of Charlottesville and in conjunction with the City's consultant, Timmons Group. Thank you for your interest in the project. In this presentation, we will be providing an overview of the project, sharing key takeaways from various public outreach events, highlighting the major design features to be implemented, and reviewing the process moving forward from here. If after this presentation, you would like to learn more about the details of the project, you can visit our project website at www.barracksemmetimprovements.com. You can also review this presentation in its entirety or submit any questions you may have by visiting this website. First, we will give an overview of the project, including the purpose of the project, project limits, general scope of improvements, project budget, and overall schedule of design development activities. The purpose of the project is to improve the operational performance of the Barracks Road and Emmett Street intersection, while also enhancing bicycle, pedestrian, and transit facilities serving the adjacent neighborhoods. The limits of the project range from the intersection of Barracks Road and Emmett Street, then extending eastwardly along Barracks Road to its intersection with Buckingham Road and Hilltop Road. In 2018, the City of Charlottesville submitted an application for funding through the Virginia Department of Transportation's Smart Scale Prioritization Process, which provides funding for local projects across the state on a competitive basis. The project was awarded $8.6 million of state and federal funding in order to improve the Barracks Road and Emmett Street intersection, as well as provide multimodal upgrades along Barracks Road. The general scope of improvements, as outlined in the Smart Scale application, include construction of a northbound right turn lane on Emmett Street, an additional westbound left turn lane on Barracks Road, upgraded traffic signal equipment, 
and increased median widths to provide enhanced refuge space for pedestrians. The scope of bicycle and pedestrian improvements on Barracks Road were somewhat less defined, which provided an opportunity to involve local citizens in the early planning and decision-making process. More to come on that in a few minutes. The planning phase of the project began in 2019 with the collection of traffic data, survey of existing conditions, defining corridor constraints, evaluating alternatives through public engagement, and developing detailed engineering design plans. The design has gone through several rounds of VDOT and city engineering review and is nearing a point suitable for acquiring right-of-way from adjacent property owners. Coordination with private utility companies have been ongoing to establish relocation strategies that minimize impacts to properties while also removing conflicts with planned construction. While right-of-way is being acquired and utilities relocated, final engineering details will be completed to gain approval by VDOT and city staff by the time the project is ready to go to construction in 2023. Next, we will review key takeaways from various public meetings and workshops that have taken place over the course of the last two years. It is the city's goal to provide continuous opportunities for the public to engage and influence the development of city transportation projects. In line with this goal, we began the planning process by meeting with individual property owners directly affected by the project and continued with the formation of a steering committee made up of various interest group representatives. With steering committee input, we learned more about the real life issues and challenges local residents face as well as what goals they would like to see accomplished with the project. We also developed effective strategies to solicit meaningful feedback from local citizens, which led to holding a public workshop in late 2019 to solicit ideas on various alternatives, which were collected by an online public survey. Key takeaways from this outreach campaign included avoiding improvements on the north side of Barracks Road, implementing a shared use path rather than in-road bicycle facilities, and most resoundingly, making all reasonable efforts to limit impacts to the existing tree canopy, which makes Barracks Road an attractive neighborhood gateway. After presenting the preferred concept in a public open house, the City of Charlottesville Planning Commission and City Council were presented with the public engagement results and preferred concept design which led to City Council passing a resolution accepting the recommendations of the Planning Commission that the proposed project is substantially in accordance with the City's comprehensive plan. Now we will take a closer look at some of the specific design features of the project, which are focused primarily on making this area of the City safer and more efficient for all users. The Barracks Road and Emmett Street intersection is a highly constrained urban confluence of heavily trafficked arterial roadways with commercial businesses flanking all corners of the intersection. As such, one of the most significant challenges faced was how to improve operations along with addressing bicycle and pedestrian safety without significantly impacting these businesses. You can see from this rendering that the eastern leg of the intersection seeks to repurpose the existing roadway between existing curb lines to provide an additional westbound left turn lane. This improves operations by allowing eastbound and westbound left turning movements to occur simultaneously. The currently skewed crosswalks have also been realigned to shorten crossing distances, which has been aided by the creation of a refuge island in the southeast corner at the CVS. The project will also widen existing medians to six feet in order to provide safe pedestrian refuge across all legs of the intersection. Finally, the existing traffic signal will be rebuilt to provide upgraded signal controls for both vehicular and pedestrian traffic, and all accommodations will be fully accessible per ADA standards. There was a significant emphasis on Barracks Road during the various public meetings held over the last two years. A couple of the concerns we heard were how the existing tree canopy might be impacted by construction of wider bicycle and pedestrian accommodations, as well as concerns over vehicle speeds traversing the steep grade of Barracks Road. To address these concerns, 
the project proposes to relocate the existing curb line on the south side of Barracks Road, which is shown on the left side of this rendered cross section, to provide narrower 11 foot travel lanes. Considering the existing lane widths range from 12 feet to 16 feet wide, this will have a calming effect on traffic in both directions. We have also minimized the width of the shared use path and grass planting strip to further reduce the overall cross section. Finally, the south side of Barracks Road will feature a decorative retaining wall focused on limiting impacts to private properties, existing trees, and their root systems. Barracks Road will also feature enhanced bus stops in both directions of the CAT bus route on Barracks Road across from Hessian Road in the eastbound direction and at Meadowbrook Road in the westbound direction. The Hessian Road bus stop pictured in this rendering will include a special design cantilever bus shelter intended to minimize interference with shared use path users, which is a slight deviation from the design of the city's standard shelter. The Meadowbrook Road bus stop will feature improved crosswalk accessibility and curb protection for waiting passengers. As previously mentioned, one of the most significant concerns we heard across all spectrums of the community was to preserve the neighborhood character created by the existing tree canopy that drapes over Barracks Road. Although there will be several trees that will be impacted by the project, even with the use of retaining walls, we will be supplementing the forested areas behind the walls in a way that will help reestablish the canopy over time. To create some order in how this is accomplished, and in consideration of compatibility with surrounding species, we have strategically located large deciduous, flowering, and evergreen trees within available spaces. And since these trees will be planted on private property to replenish what was lost, each of the owners will have an opportunity to select from a menu of compatible species approved by the city. This is a recent picture of existing Barracks Road looking downgrade near the intersection of Buckingham Road. You will notice the steep slopes with dense vegetation on both sides, narrow sidewalk up against traffic, and wide travel lanes, which create a hazardous environment for bicycles and pedestrians. This graphic illustrates how Barracks Road will become more suitable for safe multimodal travel when the project is completed. Along with relocating the existing curb to help calm traffic and maximize the use of available space, the project will also feature the addition of a grass buffer and variable height retaining wall with brick pattern architectural treatments, which will run the entire length of Barracks Road between Hessian Road and Buckingham Road. The retaining walls will also include a concrete ditch behind the wall to capture drainage before it runs over the wall and onto the shared use path, as well as wall mounted path lighting, which provides an appealing visual effect at night. This path lighting was chosen as a way to avoid lateral obstructions created by street light poles in the buffer strip, while also creating a safe and attractive experience for local residents traveling home at night. Finally, let's have a look at our next steps in the process. Once we conclude the process of compiling and responding to comments received during this design public hearing, we will seek approval of the design from City Council. After that, we will request and obtain authorization from VDOT to proceed to the right-of-way acquisition phase of the project, which will then allow us to have detailed conversations with property owners directly affected by the construction of the project. We expect that this process may last a year or more, but once it concludes and the design is finalized, we will be able to proceed with moving private utilities and begin construction of the project, which is anticipated in 2023. We hope the information shared in this presentation has been helpful in your understanding of the project. As a reminder, if you would like to submit any questions or comments related to the project for consideration by the city, or view other plans or materials illustrating the proposed features of the project, you may visit the project website at www.barracksemmettimprovements.com. There will also be an opportunity during the public comment period of this design public hearing to provide comments, or if you need special assistance seeing or understanding the project plans, 
you can call or email Kyle Kling, City of Charlottesville Project Manager, at klingk at charlottesville.gov or by calling 434-970-3394 to set up an appointment at City Hall. Please submit any questions or comments you may have by July 21st, 2021. All comments provided by the state will be responded to in writing and available on the project website by August 6, 2021. Thank you very much for your time and interest in the Barracks Road and Emmett Street Improvements Project. All right, with that uh, being done, we'd like to open it up now for any questions that uh, attendees may have. Um, so if you could use the raise hand uh, icon located in the uh, toolbar of the Zoom uh, feature, uh, we'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Also, I see we have one phone in call listener. So if you also wanna ask the question, you could just hit star nine on your telephone and that will be the equivalent to the raise hand icon. But right now I see three hands. So we're gonna go ahead and start with Joel Bass. Hi, Joel, can you hear us? You might have to unmute your mic. Joel, if you can hear us, click the um, mute, unmute button on your screen. I'm gonna try somebody else. So next we have Mary Louise. Mary Louise, can you hear us? You also need to unmute your microphone. There we go, all set. Okay. <laughs> I got it now. Um, one of the things that has come up quite quite frequently in the um, intersection at Barracks at Emmett is we have a lot of panhandlers and one of them one of them is really apt to get killed someday and because he dances and things and the, my thought is that if Is that this new configuration is more appealing to those people, and right, right. nobody does anything about it. Any way to keep everybody safe? Mary Louise, you we're hearing about every other word. Are we? Done? <laughs> Mary Louise, can you hear us? We only got about half of that. Um, we Most of your words were choppy and we only heard about every other word. So if you could repeat your question, that would be great. I'm gonna try it now. Can you hear me better? That's yeah. better. The intersection of Barracks and Emmett is such a magnet to panhandlers. And this new configuration seems so much better for them. Is there anything that can be done to prevent that? Yeah, it, it's a great question, Mary Louise. So I think holistically, we have to look at all pedestrians in general um, when we take into account a project of this nature. Um, unfortunately, I just think that's a circumstance of living in an, an urban environment is that you'll have those individuals who who gravitate to those locations. Um, I think from a design perspective, having those refuge islands there provide a more uh, welcoming environment for individuals who are actually, you know, maneuvering through the intersection. Um, you know, it's something we can definitely touch base with, uh, with the PD on and see what can be done to help kind of mitigate that. But uh, from a design perspective, um, having those refuge islands there are really um, beneficial. Perhaps, perhaps if they were, it was smaller and there was less standing area. Because one guy built a camp out there. 
Yeah, so, so unfortunately, in order to for it to be considered a pedestrian refuge island, it has to be a certain width, and I believe that is six feet, um, which is what we designed this to. So we are designing these to, you know, the minimal extent possible. Um, like I said, I, I really believe it's just a product of the environment. Um, we can, like I said, we can work with police to see what can be done um, and work with our code enforcement department as well. Um, but I think it's probably likely something that's going to continue to exist. Um, the, police, the police told me tough. There was really nothing they could do. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have any other means um, to answer that besides working with the police department. It's, it's out of my peer purview as a project manager. Um, you know, like I said, our focus here is to design, uh, you know, a project that's beneficial to, to all users. And I'm going to reshare my screen real quick just to pull up a rendering of the project in case there's any specific questions here. Um, we can kind of work off of a map so everybody knows uh, what we're talking about. All right, so we're going to try Joel Boss again to see if we can hear him this time. Hello, Joel, can you hear us? Joel? I'm going to, he's on another Zoom, so I'm gonna to try to bring his other self in. Hey, Joel, can you hear us? You'll have to hit un- Ah, I got a message. We're getting a lot of light. You need to turn off your Yeah, you are, ha you are having a few technical issues. Um, Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Are you still on the Zoom? We're getting a lot of feedback. So if you're on two screens or listening to this on another device, can you turn that one off? Okay, how are we doing now? Perfect. Great. So I just have a question of this has been a long time question for me about Charlottesville and planning and development is how do we actually develop in this town without working with UVA and getting feedback from them on their plans? And I mean, let's face it, this intersection, you know, we haven't had any events lately, but it totally shuts down when there's a basketball game or a football game or a concert. Um, it's also the right-hand lane is the problem, turning right. It backs all the way up to the top of the hill. You got, you're adding another left-hand lane we don't need another left-hand lane. People can't even get into that lane because they're backed all the way up their throat. So, I mean, I don't think you're really addressing uh, the issues here. I think you're using grant money when you're not really addressing any traffic problem here. And, and how do we do planning in this town without talking to UVA? So Joel, I'll go ahead and tackle the UVA question first. Um, so in our department, we meet quarterly with the university to discuss um, projects that the city is administering as well as projects that the university has throughout their grounds. And um, during those conversations, we always discuss how things will trend during the future and how projects may supplement each other. So, so that coordination is ongoing um, with us in the Office of the Architect at UVA. Um, in terms of major events, it's something we, we discuss um, as well from time to time when these projects are going on. I think we're far enough out with this project that there's still a little bit of coordination that needs to be done um, during the construction phase, but I can assure you that those conversations will take place and we'll make sure that uh, we'll minimize any disruptions um, or, or try to mitigate those to our fullest extent um, when that time comes. 
And but, then, but are these public communications public to everyone else or are they private to you and UVA? Yeah, they, because that's really not fair that we, where is this documented in your, you know, presentation that UVA is on board with this, they know the implications. I mean, don't, let's face it, we don't have any traffic in the summer. We have traffic when UVA is in town. You know, they don't pay for it, but right now you don't have a problem at the intersection. You do in the fall. And I don't know how you could ever address this without having them have some impact. Like, should this be the corridor into the city or not? That needs to be partly discussed and coordinated with them. And it needs to be public. And I wanna participate in that conversation between you and UVA or me, my town and UVA. And that, that's understood. Um, so they have been involved with this project outside of that um, internal meeting as well. They do have a representative on this project steering committee. So they've been on board with this since uh, we kicked that off back in 2019. Um, so like I said, they there is that communication back and forth with them on various aspects, uh, particularly on, on this project as well. And then I, I guess to answer your second question, I'll, I'll kick it off with a high level and then I'll defer to Brian or Brennan for specifics, but uh, you're right. There is a large queue back up uh, up the hill currently, during, particularly during peak hours. Um, by adding an additional lane to that intersection, uh, a lot of the issues we're seeing now is that people cannot get into the left-hand turn lanes to make uh, that movement in the existing condition. Um, in the proposed condition, we're hoping to filter more traffic into those dual turn lanes, which will shorten that queue and allow people um, to get access to those turn lanes. Um, the right I don't see any. Lane. I don't see any evidence of that at all. Uh, so I'll take that, Joel. I'm, I'm the traffic engineer for the city. Um, by adding the additional left turn lane, it allows us to run the the opposite left turn lane. So if you're heading eastbound and westbound at the same time. Um, which gives us more time at the intersection to, to allow for green. So it, it cuts down on the amount of time that we have to allocate to each leg of the intersection. So it gives us more time overall. Um, it also allows us to separate the right turn, left turn, and through lane um, so that you don't have people that are wanting to turn right. Because I believe right now it's a right and a through, if I'm remembering correctly. So you, you have people that you know, are going through to continue out to 250 on barracks um, that might be in that right turn lane as well as the people who are turning right to head north on 29. So separating those out allow people to, to make the, the proper movements and, and that left turn lane actually does more than it looks like because it allows us to run both of those at the same time. One other thing that I'll mention uh, is that we did the traffic analysis on this. The most efficient configuration was actually having two dedicated left turn lanes, one through, and then have the outside lane be a through right to have that to actually can maintain that through right movement in the far and the westbound right turn movement. Um, one of the other things that we heard was that people didn't like that movement being a through right uh, because of the one car on a red light that may clog up the works for people who want to make right turns through there, um, which makes sense, uh, except for when uh, it backs up to the point where people can't get to the right turn lane. Now, the way this is set up is that if that becomes an issue in the future and we need even more capacity, we can easily restripe those arrows and, and configure the signal in such a way that allows that to become a through right in the future if we need to. So it does have a little bit of flexibility built in, but the way it's configured right now is based on some of the public feedback. That we've heard. So next up we have John Lewis. John, can you hear us? Yes, hi. Um, thanks for uh, taking the time to answer my questions. I'm a resident uh, close to Barracks Road. I use this intersection as a driver, as a pedestrian, and, and as a bike rider, and I frequently use that hill as well uh, for all those methods. I, not walking, but certainly biking and driving. So I'm very familiar with the situation. I like the design here, and I think this will yield a lot of improvements. Um, my question is, during construction, 
what are the plans to accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists up this key route into the city for people who live uh, on the other side to the west? Sure, great question. Uh, Brian, can you provide specific specifics on that? I'll, I'll just say sure. that uh, as, as part of this, we do intend to keep uh, pedestrian access and bicycle routes open throughout the entire um, duration of construction, but Brian will be able to provide uh, more specifics on that. Yeah, there's no doubt this is a challenge um, with a constrained corridor with only two lanes to work with and the fact that we're relocating the curb inward to the roadway does present some of those challenges. Now, some of the, what we've done is we've set up a work zone, a bike and pedestrian area, as well as one lane of traffic as work is going on, um, which would be handled via um, a flagging operation. So basically during off peak hours, um, you know, so during the normal times of day when traffic is low, we would be running a flagging operation, one lane of traffic to be able to provide a working area, an area for, for bikes and pedestrians. We're also requiring the contractor to keep a portable ramp on, on hand for, uh, for their ability to move it up and down the corridor as needed to provide continuous accessibility to some of those areas. Uh, but it is our intent to provide uh, those continuous opportunities for bikes and pedestrians to have their space. Now that said, there may be instances during construction where a construction vehicle may need to take part of that. Uh, and obviously they will need to be cognizant of any users that are, that are you know, using that space um, in, in some of those instances, but it is our plan to, uh, to provide that accommodation. Next up we have Gregory Kastner. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, first, just want to say kudos. I think this is a, a great design. Uh, I live in a, the adjacent kind of Rugby Hills area. And much like, much like John, I am a, a commuter on bike, kind of all throughout the city. And uh, I'm really thrilled with the uh, uh, shared use trail that they have on the side. Uh, as I've said in numerous forums, when he just paint a bike lane on the road that is not really a comforting place to be on as a bike and really happy to see this separated um, bike lane. I guess my, my question is, um, as you're on the, the bike lane coming up the road, how does that kind of transition to the current sidewalk? Because with it ending at Hilltop, there's still a fair bit of up to go where the rider is going to be going pretty slow and really wouldn't be a great place to get kind of dumped out on the road. How, how do you envision that um, transition working? I mean, to me, a more natural place for it to end would be up uh, just a little bit further up at Rugby where the hill kind of flattens out and you can get a little speed and merge into traffic a little bit better. That's it, thank you. Yeah, that's it, thanks. So just to clarify, I believe you're talking about the intersection up here at Buckingham Road. Um, so we envision it to, Kind of terminate as it's shown here so the individual would come off of the shared use path and then likely we could put a shero here to continue all, along words to rugby i do know um, that there are some plans in the works on the city's end to kind of continue bike and pedestrian upgrades uh further into town along this stretch um but for now unfortunately we, we are constrained to what the limits were stated in our smart scale application so uh, those will terminate currently at uh, Buckingham Road. Brian, yeah, Brennan, we go. we do have um, it, it won't be a, a shared use path, uh, but we do have marking plans for when Preston Avenue is repaved and stuff um, to continue by bicycle facilities um, up and and through the the corridor. All right, so next we have Patricia Gibson and she's the last person who is raising their hand. So if you guys do have a question you'd like to ask, now is the time and we'll go into public comment after that. If you don't have a question, but you just wanna make a comment. Hi, Patricia, can you hear us? You might have to unmute your mic. Okay, can you hear me now? Sure can. Right. Um, could you move the, ba the map back down to the intersection of Barracks Road and Emmett? I live on Meadowbrook Road, and we, um, before the development of CVS and the uh, Kava um, strip there, 
very often we would walk to Barracks Road to get to see the CDS. With the traffic problems, a lot of traffic is flowing down Meadowbrook Road to avoid the intersection. And that includes fire trucks and police trucks. When the development for CDS and the strip across was under consideration, we asked about putting speed bumps on Meadowbrook Road. And we were told that there was not enough sight line for the vehicles to safely stop for a speed bump. And my question in the planning commission meeting was, well, if it's not enough sufficient distance to stop for a speed bump, it certainly wouldn't be sufficient distance to stop for pedestrians. So consequently, we most often do not come from Meadowbrook Road to get onto Barracks Road at that intersection anymore. I think there's already been a fatality at that intersection when someone was trying to come up. My question is, I would be very interested to see, could a portion of where Meadowbrook Road meets that road be blocked off the way it is, it's marked off on the pavement, um, east of Whole Foods so that the cars do not block the intersection. The thing I notice is the cars approach that intersection coming down uh, Preston and Barracks Road, they exceed the 25 miles per hour. When you're on Meadowbrook Road, you can't see the cars coming down and they're trying to make it through the light. And so they come barreling down there. When the traffic is stopped, they've blocked the intersection. So the increased traffic from the development can't get out on that intersection and you can't get across there. So my question is, can that be addressed where Meadowbrook Road meets that? I mean, it would seem that traffic could queue up in those, tra those turn lanes that you're creating and they could start moving, but there's no way for us to get our cars in there. Thanks, Patricia. That's a great question. Um, I'm not familiar if there's a, an existing don't block the intersection sign out there, but I, I think that's something we can consider uh, looking at in further detail as we move forward with the design. I will um, just real quickly touch base on our plans for Meadowbrook. So as you can see here, we do have this median island running the length of Barracks Road, uh, which will essentially prohibit any turning left-hand turning movement from Barracks Road onto Meadowbrook. Um, subsequently, it will also force Meadowbrook Road to become uh, right in, right out, which means you can only access Meadowbrook Road if you're traveling westbound on Barracks, and you can only exit Meadowbrook Road um, in, the, in the direction of Barracks Road as well. Um, hopefully that will mitigate some of those, uh, the amount of vehicles that are coming in and out of Meadowbrook uh, currently. And, and like I said, we'd be happy to take a look at what we can do to kind of, um, I guess, incorporate vehicles not blocking that intersection. So next we have is Georgie Kettler. Hi Georgie, can you hear us? You might have to unmute your mic. Georgie, if you can hear me, hit the unmute mic icon. So I'm going to try to bring her back in another time because we have a couple more hands raised. Um, up next is Martha. Martha, can you hear us? You're going to have to hit the unmute um, button. Okay, I just did. Perfect. Okay, I want to make a comment in the comment sec uh, section of this, but I also want to ask two questions. One, what about pedestrians crossing Barracks Road, which right now you take your life in your hands to cross either at Blue Ridge or at Hilltop? I see on your map right now that the Hessian Road has a little walk thing. But does that mean that there'll be a light there that you can push to 
cross to go across the street or are you just going to have to hope that cars see the crosswalk and stop? Yeah, for, for right now, Martha, we are um, just mimicking existing conditions in our proposed plan out there. So we will restripe those existing crosswalks at Hessian and Blue Ridge. Um, right now, we don't have anything in the works to have any type of flashing signals um, at either well, what one What about those... Hilltop? Yeah, it's, it's the same at Hilltop as well. Um, so we... we... Sorry about yeah, that. I, I feel that's not very friendly to people that live here. I mean, there should be some way to cross without taking your life in your hands. Yeah, it's a good uh, good question. And thanks for the comment. Uh, at Hilltop, there is a little bit of a sight distance issue there as well currently. So um, I think forcing pedestrians down to Blue Ridge or Hessian to cross um, is a little more uh, safe for those individuals who are wishing to do so. Uh, we have received a couple other comments of that nature um, as well. So like I um, told the last individual, it's something we can take a look at and see if we can potentially incorporate it into the design uh, as we move forward. One thing I'll add is that we are incorporating a four by four space for people to wait. You know, so at Hessian Road, the crosswalk markings pretty much just run into the the ditch, for lack of a better term, um, uh, but we are going to designate an area in the corner at both intersections for for the, the location where we want people to to wait to cross. And all the signage that exists there today uh, will remain in place. All right. So next we have Tara Little. Tara, can you hear us? You might have to unmute. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. I just have a quick question and maybe I can see this on your on the dedicated website. The rendering looks just beautiful and such a lovely improvement. But I wonder about the actual brick facade you mentioned that it's not real brick, that it's some sort of a brick looking facade. Is there a way to see what that actually looks like in uh, you know, the, the, re the actual material that will be used? Because it, it, it can make such a huge difference. It is, Go ahead, Brian. it is concrete. Uh, it's called a form liner. So basically the concrete is formed into the pattern of the brick and then it's painted. Uh, we, this did come up uh, during some of our steering committee meetings as to how, how this might look and feel and you know, is it gonna look like real brick? And we actually had some samples made by a form liner contractor uh, that we're familiar with. Uh, we actually wanted them to, um, to actually send a, an actual concrete you know, just, just as it would be, but it was like two tons and pretty expensive to be delivered to the site. Um, and so we had a smaller two by two uh, sample with some of the architectural treatments that uh, were chosen by the steering committee. We actually had several samples for different patterns. Uh, we considered, I think five different options um, and it was chosen uh, pretty clearly that uh, the brick pattern uh, with some kind of, um, more of like the rustic brick kind of look. And we try to, to make the rendering look much like the, the chosen brick pattern there. Um, but uh, I think Kyle, um, I don't know, do you still have those samples? Uh, good question. I have pictures of those samples for certain. Um, so if you would like to shoot me an email, I'd be happy to send those over to you and I'll do my best to track down uh, those samples that we do have. All right, um, so just to let everybody know, we will be moving to the, uh, in the essence of time, we will be moving to the formal public comment period here in uh, about five minutes. Uh, it seems like we have three questions left, so we'll do our best to get through those. Um, if anybody has any questions that we can't get to, I'll be happy to stay on for a few minutes uh, at the end of the meeting and uh, answer any remaining questions that may pop up. All right, so we're gonna bring in Peter next. Hi, this is hi. This is Peter Krebs from the Piedmont Environmental Council. Um, question for you about the trees um, and a related sort of part two. Um, so while there are lots of trees on that corridor, 
they're um, not necessarily uh, super healthy, lots of invasive species through there. First part of the question is, are all the trees um, uh, going to be on private land uh, with, you know, maintenance implications? And then the second part is if the project uh, implementation might include like a, a sweep through uh, to remove invasives and generally beautify the corridor. Yeah, Peter, thanks for the uh, question. Uh, so to answer your first question, yes, all the trees that we'll be replanting will be located on private property. Um, we'll work through specifics with those property owners during the negotiation phase on how those maintenance agreements um, will work. Um, and I think to answer your second question, so we'll work closely with urban forestry. We have identified trees on our site plan currently that are to be removed. Um, I think during construction, we'll just take a deeper look at those uh, trees that aren't marked. And if we identify some of those that uh, we believe need to come out or urban forestry, uh, you know, believe should come out due to them being invasive, um, we'll approach that at that time. All right, so next we have Patricia Gibson. Hi, Hi. Um, I had one question. When the pedestrian crosses Emmett Street at Barracks Road from the bank building walking to CVS, the traffic on Barracks Road that would head south turning on to Emmett Street toward the university makes a right turn on red when the light is flashing for pedestrians to cross from the bank to CVS, it's, they, again, they don't have a sight line, the drivers, to see pedestrians and they could be approaching that intersection at a high speed. Are they still going to be able to make the right-hand turn when the pedestrian light is on? Brian, can you tackle that? I I would envision that they so would have when, to come to it. Go ahead. Are you referring to the uh, the northern leg, so crossing to the Kaaba or crossing to the CVS? Oh, she's she's off. Um, yeah, Brian, I, Brian, I think it yeah. was vehicles heading towards town on barracks, on this western leg of barracks, making yeah. right-hand turns on what I presume of now is a, is a red, so a stop and then making a right-hand turn because there's no turn on red there. Yeah. Um, or there's not can, a no turn on red. Right now there's no turn on red or there is no, there is not a no turn on red sign. Is that, is that what you're saying? That's what I picked up now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so we can look at that. Uh, we will basically need to evaluate the site distance there. Uh, there is a wall on that corner of the bank that does uh, provide some challenges with viewing uh, uh, the pedestrians crossing the street there, but that's, that's a good comment and that's something that we can definitely look at to see if, if it's appropriate to uh, restrict those right from movements um, while that um, walk indication is on for that crossing movement. Perfect. All right, so it is 650 um, and we still have three hands raised like Kyle mentioned. If you guys want to stick around after the end of public comment, you're more than welcome to ask some questions then or if you want to shoot him over an email. Um, but we are going to move into the public comment portion now. So if you have a public comment you'll like to make, now you can raise your hand and um, we will allow you to make your comment. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just add, Lachine, real quick, thanks for that introduction. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, council meetings or uh, planning commission meetings, each individual will be uh, limited to three minutes to make their comments. Uh, I understand that not every individual is comfortable speaking tonight. So if there are any comments um, that people wanna share with the design team, uh, we have those means available via email and on the comment form on the project website. Uh, the way things are going to work this evening is uh, you will make your comment. We will not be responding to those this evening. Um, what we will do is we will log those comments into a comment log. And then uh, once we have all written comments and the verbal comments from this evening, we will um, compile those 
and analyze those and see what we can and cannot incorporate into the design moving forward. And then we will publish those, that comment log uh, on the website no later than August 6th. And as Brian indicated earlier, uh, the public comment period is going to be open for another two weeks following this evening. Um, so until July 23rd, I believe. So that's Friday, July 23rd is when we will stop the comment period for this, uh, for this design. Um, with that being said, uh, we'll open it up to comments now. Um, and these will be logged officially as part of the public hearing transcript. So far, no hands are raised. We have one, Patricia Gibson. I'm gonna bring her on in. Hi, Patricia. Hi, just to get on the public comment. Yes, I am asking about pedestrians crossing from the bank where the wall does obscure vehicles making a right-hand turn. And as the pedestrians are walking from the bank to CVS, their back is at the traffic that's turning. So that was my concern. And the other would be vehicles trying to get onto Barracks Road from Meadowbrook Road when the cars block that intersection despite the sign that is on the right-hand side. Thank you. I really appreciate all the effort to make this a safer intersection that will clear more easily with the traffic. Thank you. Next up, we have Tara Little. Hi, Tara. Hi, back again. I guess I would just maybe make the point that I was trying to make earlier that I would lobby for an attractive brick in that in that um, you know in your materials. I mean, it is a gateway to UVA this corridor, and it can be truly as attractive as your rendering or it can not be very attractive if the material is is cheap and fake looking i don't know how, how best to explain it but i i'm lobbying for 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 good looking material as far as that brick facade goes on the wall thank you No one else has raised their hand yet so far. So I'll, I'll just reiterate for those in attendance, um, this comment section is what will be tracked as part of the public comment log. So if anybody has any comments, good, bad, otherwise, now would be the time to provide those to the design team. Um, these are what are being analyzed and part of our evaluation moving forward. Um, so we'd welcome any feedback that people may have. All right, next up we have Mary Louise. Mary Louise, you're gonna have to go unmuted, right? Yes, you're unmuted now. Um, if you can't make a left-hand turn onto barracks from Meadowbrook, doesn't that imply that there's going to be a lot more traffic up Spotswood and Blue Ridge? Because right now, Blue Ridge is so dangerous because there's lots of blind corners. It's a narrow road and um, there's no streetlights. This just thought. Next we have Georgie Kettler. Hi, Georgie. Hi, this is actually her husband, Herb. And I wanted to express concern about this shared path for pedestrians and bicyclists. And I assume scooters count in there too, although it wasn't mentioned. Uh, and I wanna know how those 
bicycles and scooters are going to be managed so that the pedestrians are not threatened threatened by the the bicycle and scooter traffic. At this time, no one else has raised their hand. Okay, so I'll make a final call for any public comments. Um, please use the raise hand feature if you wish to do so. Um, or the star nine if you are a telephone caller and you want to make a comment. All right, next we have Martha. Hi, Martha, you have to hit the unmute button on your screen. Looks like you still might be muted. Um, she is not unmuting, so we'll see if we can bring her back in in a bit. And we have another comment from Georgie or her husband. Yes, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, I didn't, I couldn't tell whether you heard my comments about the usage of the joint pedestrian path and how, how you're gonna manage A, the safety of the pedestrians with bicyclists on there and secondly, are the scooters going to be allowed on there as well, which is even more threatening to a walker. Thank you. We got it. Okay. It wasn't clear from. All right. We're going to try to bring in Martha one last time. Martha, can you hear us? Yeah, now I can hear you. Perfect. Um, I would also like to express concern about these multi-reuse paths. I have a dog that I walk on a leash and I walk down on the Riverview Road, you know, the river road down um, in the, um, the, the area down past uh, the woolen mills. And with bikes coming up behind you, with skateboards coming up behind you, with children on scooters coming up behind you. It's really, I'm sure there must be some rules for these, but I feel that we're not very good at, at, in, at making the rules for traffic speeding <laughs> um, any better. I don't know who is gonna monitor the rules for multi-use paths, but it's really hard to walk a dog on those paths. Um, when there are people coming up behind you on bikes and whatnot. So I think we really have to look at that. And I also feel that bikes will probably, if they're going down the hill, would want to be going down on the, when they ride with traffic, which would be riding on the north side of the road. And there's a terrible ditch there. It's not very, um, not very safe. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that. And I'm still very concerned about the crosswalks. I think something has to be done to have at least one lighted where you can push a button and traffic stops on that stretch of road, whether it's at Blue Ridge, whether it's at Hessian, whether it's at um, Hilltop, but there should be some way, this is still a neighborhood, even though I don't think you've treated it like that in my opinion. Um, but I think we should be able to get across the street to go walk in the neighborhood. So those are my two big concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Um, up next, we have Crystal. Hi, Crystal. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry, I came in a little bit late. I was taking care of my uh, three-year-old. Um, he needed to run around tonight. Uh, so maybe this has already been covered, but I just, I just want to say that I, I like, uh, the dual, the multi, multi-use bike lanes. Um, I mean, I would ideally like to see a lane on each side of the, a bike lane on each side of the road. So that maybe some of those 
pedestrian bike dog walker incidents would be spread out a little bit more um i'd like to say i also go to riverview park and i i walk on that path again with my son um and we've never really had an issue people with bikes will ring their bike bell when they're behind you um i have issues with people with their dogs off leash but that's probably not what we're going to deal with on this road um i get that this is a this is a neighborhood road or a road that borders a neighborhood, but I, I, I like that it's going to actually be used for like people commuting to and from work. I think that's a great use of this, this road um, and space alongside this road. Again, I'd like bike lanes on both sides, but I don't feel like the landowners in this area would be too happy with that. Um, the other thing on this that I kind of, the thing on this I kind of have issue with also is the slip lanes from Emmett to um, Barrett, Barracks on the sides. Um, I feel like those are also not pedestrian friendly. Um, and they're just, they're just a danger to pedestrians. And if what you're trying to do here is to like help people commute safely and get across this, this huge intersection safely, slip lanes are a pretty bad way of doing that. Um, and I also, I like the small islands, uh, the pedestrian, like whatever they're called, safe islands uh, to help you cross the street. It'd be nice if there was like a tree in them because it, as a pedestrian, it's not the most pleasant thing to stand in the middle of traffic um, in the sun uh, on a road that is busy. Um, but those are the slip lanes I don't like. And I, I think it's great if people can bike up and down this, this major artery into and out of town. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. Thank you. Currently, no other hands are raised, Kyle. Okay, so um, just real quick uh, to Crystal's comment. This is something that we've gotten a lot of written comments about where the slip lanes. I'm not going to go into detail about them right now, but I just would like to reiterate uh, it's not clear on the plans. Those will be stop controlled slip lanes. So they are not free flowing. We will have signals at those slip lanes uh, to help control that movement. All right, if there are no further questions or comments at this time, we'll go ahead and formally end the public comment period. Um, as I reiterated earlier on, this public comment period will remain open for the next two weeks. So if you review the presentation and have additional comments, please feel free to submit those via the website or by contacting me directly, uh, either through email or by giving me a call. Um, this presentation will be posted um, on the city's website uh, within the next couple of days as well, if anybody wishes to review it. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and end the public comment period and I will stick around for a couple minutes to answer any additional questions that uh, individuals may have. All right, we have a couple people with some questions. First up is Georgie. Uh, I have a question, of, actually it's her, but I have a question about the access to the uh, backside of CVS and the, the Meadowbrook shops back there and how that traffic will flow now when you flow out and when you flow in. Uh, I, I understand what it does now. I guess I'm questioning in, in particular, if I'm leaving, can I still go left into the traffic stream toward uh, Emmett? And secondly, um, when I come down from barracks, will I be able to turn left into there and into the uh, Meadowbrook thing? Because right now it's a big jumble of two roads coming together and it's not clear how you access them. Yeah, so, so that was something that we had talked about with CVS while they were, submitting their plans. Um, currently we're showing it unchanged. You'll still be able to 
turn left into and out of there. Um, but accidents at that location are being monitored. If at any point in the future, um, you know, there is a, uh, an accident history that develops there, um, we can close that off. We've, we've already had that conversation with CVS that their access may be limited in the future due to, to accident concerns. Thank you. All right, so next we have Peter. Hello, um, quick question that I think might be of interest is, is the um, city council action on an agenda yet? And if so, what's the date of that meeting? Yeah, great question, uh, Peter. It is not on the agenda yet. I'm envisioning it's going to be probably the second meeting in August, if not the first meeting in September. Um, it's gonna take us a little bit to get through these comments and incorporate anything we need to um, into design and, and put that final uh, design public hearing packet together. But um, hopefully we're at in front of council, um, you know, a month and a half from now. Um, next we have Tara Little. Um, Kyle, quick question. Will the overhead um, lines be buried in, as a part of the construction process? Uh, they will not. So we will be relocating some pools along the corridor further into um, the bank on the south side of the street, but we will not be uh, undergrounding any utilities as part of this project. Okay. Well, then you'll want to make some sort of arrangements for these special trees that we're trying to maintain because as you've probably noticed, the Esplendi trucks go in, have already gone into this you know, group of trees and they just cut them off. And that's why they're so misshapen now. Um, so if you're going to all the trouble to buy trees and plant trees and protect the canopy, they're gonna be, I'm just more, you know, they're gonna cut, they're gonna cut them down to, to uh, inappropriately. Yeah, absolutely. So, um... We'll continue to look into that as we move forward and, and be certain to put trees in those locations that um, you know, aren't gonna interfere with the overhead lines. Thank you. Um, next question is from Joel. Hey, I, I just wanted to ask him. So is this a done deal and we're just negotiating the details or is this still up for being approved? So the funding for the project has been allocated. Uh, right now we are at the 60% design phase. So I would say that all the major design characteristics are relatively set in stone. I think some of the issues that we discussed tonight, such as improving crossings further up barracks or uh, you know, things of that nature uh, can be incorporated or we can take a look into incorporating those into the project. But I think overall the general intent of the project as it's shown here is, is what we'll be moving forward with. Next we have Patricia Gibson. Hi. Um, when CBS was in the planning stages, as you said, they designed their site to accommodate the addition of that turn lane there. Shortly before CBS was proposed, Clara Wheeler was proposing an apartment building on her property to the, I guess that would be the east of the CBS. As you design this corridor, is there any consideration for the traffic flowing out of there? I didn't know if her project was going to resurface uh, or be resubmitted once the uh, R1 is rezoned to allow for multiple dwellings. So we took into account all approved um, site plans when we were doing the traffic analysis, um, but we're also extremely constrained, um, you know, by the buildings and stuff that are already on this intersection. So 
there's there's not too much more we can do to optimize or or fit more vehicles through here. So if there's another development that goes in, it will it might have some mitigation factors that they would have to do internally or um, something may be limited on the site to, you know, because of the traffic on the roadway, but there's really not much more we can do to, to accommodate even more vehicles through the intersection. Thank you. Next we have Martha. Yeah, I'm back again. You know, I feel one of the big drawbacks of this whole project has been that the people that are most affected, which was only about six houses, I'm not one of those, but were the only ones that really were being impacted. So you didn't really have a lot of comment from people that traverse this road on a daily basis, love coming up this road where the trees cover the road. And so you, even tonight, I feel you're not really getting enough comments to make you realize that this is a major change to an entrance to our city. And I really think that now that we have really no, you're saying it's pretty much a fait accompli. You know, I've come down to both your meetings at both city council and planning commission where they just rubber stamped it, that it was okay with your smart scale, wherever you get your money or whatever. But this is critical to the look of people coming into our city. And I feel that the only thing we have left to really ask you to do is make this wall not be out of character with our Jeffersonian city. And, uh, you know, a fake brick wall, it just, if it's really, I would like to come down and see it. So I would like, I'm gonna get in touch with Kyle Kling and have you send me pictures, but that's critical to the look of this thing at this point. Seeing as we can't stop it, we, we can at least give our comments that, and there are not enough people in my opinion, giving comments right now. So you're gonna think, oh, well, nobody cares, but they do care and they're gonna care when we ruin this entrance to the city. So let's, I think it's on your shoulders now to make this look as good as possible. And to me, the only thing left to really work on is what the wall looks like. And then I do worry, I'll have to say, having lived here for 30 years, I worry about who's gonna mow this grassy strip but we'll get to that at another time. But please concentrate on this wall and make sure that it really fits into the character of this city. Thank you. Doesn't look like there's any more questions or hands raised. I lied, we have another one. Hi, Patricia. I just, I just wanted to say again, I really appreciate the effort to improve the safety for all of us that come through this intersection. It's a lot of hard work. And while we want to maintain a character and look, um, the safety and the traffic flow, I think, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I just thank you again for the city and the designers involved in this. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. It's always good to hear the positive feedback as well. Um, we have a question from Drew Dunnington. Uh, hello. Yeah. You know, I, I would like to say, well, I, I like to design. I think, you know, there's limiting ability to do what you need to do and you're making the best of a situation that exists today. My question or comment is more about the stormwater runoff from, I guess, Hilltop to Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge to Hessian, and then Hessian to Meadowbrook on the north side of Barracks. I see in the renderings, you have a 
It looks like stormwater management plan on the south side with the curbing gutter system. What's the plan for the north side, particularly when you cross these intersections? For example, today's afternoon shower, it's a small river crossing Hessian, uh, the Hessian intersection on the north side. Drew, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so uh, as, you, as I'm sure you know, uh, when you look at that ditch, which is in many cases not even a ditch, um, it screams up the hill with a highly eroded slope uh, up to Dominion power poles. And, and I, I, I would like to uh, have had the ability to make some improvements on the drainage there. Unfortunately, uh, there are too many constraints, uh, too many um, areas of concern. Once you start making uh, improvements to stormwater, you know, adding curb or even shoulders or doing any grading on that side, there's a, a tremendous amount of risk with the unstable slope that exists on that side. So our approach on this project has been make all reasonable efforts to stay off of that side, including the trees, the root systems that, in my opinion, are holding that slope together. Um, and make all of the improvements on the south side um, and mitigate that risk uh, to keep the, the project viable. Uh, so I, I guess I understand the concerns that you have and, and um, but unfortunately with the project and the scope and the budget and everything that's available for this project, uh, making improvements on both sides of the road are, are just not, not feasible uh, with some of the limitations we have. Does that kind of answer your question? Uh, Drew, you might be muted. Yeah, the pedestrian waiting zone, I think you call it, at the corner of Hessian and where Hessian crosses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know if anybody's going to be able to stand there in the rain is my concern, so. Yeah, uh, I understand. Yeah, and that, that's all on the existing pavement. That's 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 not a new pavement. That's all just kind of restriping of the existing pavement. Yeah. yeah. And if you're in a strong thunderstorm, um, yeah. I probably wouldn't advise it. Right. And I think if I see it correctly, the bus parking zone, I guess, is at Meadowbrook there. Mm -hmm. uh, to, I guess you, you'll resurface the road and I do so, the best you can with your stormwater management. But that that area today is a small pond during storm. So I, I would yeah. imagine you'll improve that. So. Yeah, it'll, it'll actually, the drainage coming down the, the face of that slope will come down and around the curb line. And then we'll be sent to the little ditch with some drainage inlets that exist a little bit farther up Meadowbrook. Great. Thanks for answering. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions or hands being raised. All right. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up this evening. Uh, as I said several times already, if you guys have any more questions, comments, concerns, whatever they may be, uh, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll get back to you um, as soon as we can on anything. Uh, I appreciate everybody's involvement in this project and looking forward to communicating with everyone uh, and providing updates as we move along. Thank you.